Garmaier. However, uh, while doing so, she became enticed and fascinated with quantum stuff. She took quite a number of quantum mechanics courses, and it's particularly, how to put it, funny for me to recall that exactly 10 years ago, we were finishing up the, uh, the course, the graduate course in quantum information science, and uh, Marisa was wrapping up the final project on the one uh, clean qubit quantum computation uh, scheme. So she graduated from here, 2010. She decided to stick to quantum science, went off to Europe uh, to work uh, in the laboratory of Anton Zeilinger on quantum foundation. Um, in 2015, she co-authored, actually she's the leading author of a very prominent paper that uh, is one of the best uh, today uh, experimental loophole free tests of Bell's inequalities. She defended the PhD uh, in, in 2016 and then moved back uh, this side of the Atlantic and became what her destiny was supposed to, so a quantum engineer. So properly speaking, she is now a senior uh, quantum engineer working at Google in uh, Santa Barbara. And as you see from her slide, we are getting very serious and building uh, Google's quantum computer. Marisa, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you for doing this remotely. And for the audience, uh, we are going to try to have interactive question, meaning uh, raise your hand. I will try to unmute, unmute you and uh, you will ask the question directly to Marisa, if, if at all possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lorenza. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I was at a remote conference recently and one of the speakers said, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would say that it's it's not a pleasure to be sitting in my bedroom looking at a box, but <laughs> it is a pleasure to be with you all in spirit. I wish we could be together in person. Um, as Lorenza indicated, I do indeed have some very fond memories of time at Dartmouth. And I sometimes joke that it's Lorenza's fault that I am here at all because she was really the first person who encouraged me that I could become a quantum engineer and sort of straddle this difference or, or this, this pond that we often see between the engineers and the physicists. And I really couldn't pick a side. Um, I felt very fortunate that I now am working in a space that allows me to be both physicist and engineer kind of at the same time. And when I started grad school, I did not dream that that would be the state of the world when I was looking for a job. So with that, I, I will launch in a little bit to this topic, which is about building a quantum computer and, and the way we are going about it at Google. Um, as Lorenz indicated, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. It's um, it's so much easier when I can see your faces and, and, and feedback on if something is clear or not. Um, so please, if, if something is unclear, feel free to ask. I'm, I may also be a bit rusty on giving talks because I haven't given so many lately, so I may be a little unclear and don't hesitate to ask. Um, okay, the, the first thing I will sort of give a bit of history is how we got started with a quantum computing project at Google in the first place. And it started uh, quite a while ago. In 2012, this guy, Hartmut Nathan, who's a computer scientist working in computer vision, so how do computers see things and recognize images, um, he was hearing about quantum computing and was starting to become curious about it and, and wondering, okay, how is this relevant to Google? How is it relevant to the world? What is, what is it for? What can we do with it? And he convinced some people at Google to give him some resources to just investigate this problem with a few people. And uh, they actually leased a D-Wave machine and started playing around with that and teaching themselves about quantum algorithms and, and how quantum mechanics works. And already two years later, they said, well, that was a lot of fun, but we want to get a little more serious about this. We want to build it ourselves." Um, this is a very Google kind of mindset. Oh, we want to go build it ourselves, But of course, they didn't know how. So they imported the UCSB superconducting qubit team uh, that was under John Martinez. 
and also really started to expand their presence and their seriousness in the research community. So rather than just being a couple of people working in some side corner office at Google, they, they started to really engage in the academic community. And uh, now the team has actually grown quite a bit in those last, uh, over the last 10 years almost. And now we're a team of over 70 people, mostly located in three different locations. Um, Hartmut's original location was in the Los Angeles Venice Beach office, and he's still there. And the applications and algorithms and, and basically the theory work is still located there. Um, the hardware effort is still in Santa Barbara because, of course, the UC Santa Barbara group was located in Santa Barbara. And uh, we also have a software team or a, a cloud interface team, we sometimes call them, that is located in Seattle. And it's a bit funny that the people in Seattle are responsible for helping the people in Santa Barbara and the people in LA talk with each other. But um, basically, the, the goal of that team is to build an infrastructure that will cleanly and smoothly enable remote access from anywhere in the world. But of course, our, our own theory team is our first test guinea pigs uh, of that quantum hardware that's being built in Santa Barbara. So that, that's sort of the way our team is distributed right now. And uh, so suppose we are, we are this team and suppose your goal, of course, I'm a hardware person. So uh, this is maybe a hardware perspective, but suppose your goal is to build a useful quantum computer. That seems like a noble goal. Uh, let's first think about what that actually means. So I'll start with the noun and go back through the adjectives. What's a computer? Uh, it's a machine that performs computational task. So we would say that uh, the, the computational task being a well-defined thing with some input and a right answer according to that input that you, you would put in. Um, okay, quantum computer, that means it needs to run on quantum mechanics or behave according to the rules of quantum mechanics, which means you need to build a controllable system with lots of qubits that will harness zillions of amplitudes. And then, of course, in order to be useful, you need a bit more than just that. We know that quantum computing is fundamentally error prone. Quantum, quantum bits are fundamentally likely or, or uh, suffer from errors. And so we need both at a theoretical level, but then also in a physical level to implement some kind of error correction scheme in order to resist the mechanisms that would otherwise break down the, the functionality of the quantum computer. Um, but that of course also is not enough. You also need your quantum computer to be good for something. That, that's really what useful means. You have to actually have something that you want to do with it. So um, if you were, if this is your goal and you work in a lab, of course, you are going to start with not just build the whole big thing, but you need to start with a prototype. Um, oh, I, yeah, so good for something. Of course, this also means that you need to be able to interact with algorithm developers who will develop algorithms that work on your machine. So that, that's important. Um, First thing, of course, to do is to build a prototype. So what do we want in our prototype? Well, we want it to be useful, so it should be compatible with some form of error correction. We want to also make sure that it's easy for us to get algorithm developers to play with it and see, can they use it? Does it work as they expect? You know, Try to, to make sure that from the get-go it's, it's useful or going in the direction of being useful. Of course, it should be quantum, and that means that we need to develop a very large scale system for controlling quantum, a uh, big quantum system. That means we need uh, excellent gates and excellent readout across a whole system. And then if we want it to be a computer, maybe a nice thing to do would be to show that uh, we can perform a small milestone computational task. And this is basically the outline of the rest of the talk. So first off, uh, error correction compatible in uh, the superconducting qubit land. So our, our group is a background in superconducting qubits, and that's that's what we are trying to build. Um, the One of the leading error correction schemes is known as the surface code. And uh, current estimates are that in order to encode a quantum state, a, a quantum bit logically in an error robust way, for one physical quantum, excuse me, for one logical quantum bit, we need about a thousand physical quantum bits. That means that the useful fault tolerant quantum computer is out at the million plus qubit regime. And until uh, about six months ago, 
the state of publications was about 10 qubits. So we have several orders of magnitude offset and a prototype should be something that we can actually build. So where, where, where do we go? Well, we know that around a thousand qubits, we can start properly testing error correction. We can try to actually build one of those logical qubits. Um, but a thousand qubits is still pretty far from 10. So prototype should be still a little bit closer to, to what was currently possible. And then we notice if we keep looking in this space that at around 50 qubits, it is no longer possible for any classical computer to simulate the, the full space of capability of a qubit machine. So if you have 50 qubits or so, it's no longer possible to replicate that performance with any kind of classical machine. And that brings us into what we call the NISC era, the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, where you you can you you need quantum hardware in order to explore this space. It's not possible to explore it in any other way. There's there's no way to investigate in here with a classical computer. And so that seems like an interesting place to try to build a prototype. Um, so we decide, okay, we should build around 50 qubits. And in order to be surface code compatible, you know, looking and going towards a surface code, we should try to build them in a 2D array. Uh, the other half of being useful, of course, is that we need a good interface with our algorithm developers. So we have uh, developed a Python framework for this, which we call CERC. And this is basically a Python framework that forces and allows the developers of algorithms to be quite aware of the physical capabilities and limitations of the hardware in question. So it, it prevents you from having inadvertently thinking that you can do a direct gate between two qubits that are uh, located on opposite sides of the chip. It forces you to know what is your qubit layout and take that into account when you are de designing your algorithm. Um, it's implemented in Python. It's uh, outfitted with some nice ASCII art, as you can see down there at the bottom, and it's uh, pretty straightforward to use. So we've, we've developed this, and this is actually what we use for programming our quantum computers. It also can be hooked up to a simulator. So this is this is available uh, for about two years now. That was also open sourced and available to the world, and that's what our algorithm developers are using. So with that, we, we launch into the real experimental physics part. So we need to actually build the thing and demonstrate, not only build it, but demonstrate that we can properly control it. So uh, first off, let me do a brief introduction of what is a superconducting microwave qubit. Perhaps not everyone is, is deeply familiar with this. So if we consider for a moment this more familiar friend, this is the standard LC harmonic oscillator. It just has one capacitor and one inductor. It's a linear circuit with a parabolic potential and evil and evenly spaced levels. If you wanted to use this guy as a qubit though, you would have a problem because the spacing between all of the levels is the same. And if you were to put in or extract one photon, you cannot control whether you are landing yourself in the first excited state or the second excited state or the zero state. Um, that that's not ideal. So instead we replace that inductor with a nonlinear element, a nonlinear inductor, or in fact a squid that changes the potential of this creature into something which is an harmonic oscillator. And now the, the level spacing between zero and one is unique. And there is, it is not the same as level spacing between any other pair of levels which means that we can encode our computational basis in zero and one, and we can stay there by nature of using the correct frequency to excite. Um, so the, the quantum information is represented as the amount of energy that is sloshing around inside the qubit. And how do we then physically make this? Uh, well, basically we take that little circuit you can implement it in silicon. In, in our case, we use aluminum, which is a superconducting metal on uh, silicon. And the capacitor is that orange plus. So the capacitance between the plus shape in the middle and that ground flood around the outside is the capacitor. And the squid is uh, implemented with two Josephson junctions in that little blue box. We can also fabricate resonators, although the resonators that we normally 
uh, I see there's a question in just a second. The resonators that we normally uh, implement are these snake style resonators. So this is a piece of transmission line which resonates according to with a frequency according to the length of the resonator. I think I think there's a hand. Does that mean it's a question? I'm not too familiar with Zoom. I'm sorry. Um, hi, can you hear me? This is Miles here. Yes. Hello, Miles. Hi. Um, so I just have a very basic question. You you in your circuit you had two Josephson junctions. Um, yes. And I'm just wondering why two instead of just one? Because surely if you have one in parallel with the capacitor, you still have a nonlinear oscillator. That is very correct. Uh, the reason we have two is because we want our circuits to be also frequency tunable. So if you have a single junction only, then the inductance depends on the amount of energy in that uh, Josephson junction element, and you will just get a nonlinear uh, circuit with frequencies that are baked in according to the, the properties of that junction and that capacitor. But if you use a squid instead, then you can use a separate drive line to drive flux in that squid, which changes the basic inductance uh, with a separate knob. And then you have both a nonlinear element, but also tunable in frequency. Thank you. That clears that up. Does that make sense? Yep. Good. Marisa? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have our, our qubits, which are these little plus shaped things. We have some control lines that come in and, and indeed the, the control lines that we, we bring in are a control line to excite the qubit and then also control line to tune its frequency as, as I just described. And then we also have some measurement stuff, and that those are these resonators, these snakes that I showed on this, whoops, wrong direction. These snakes are simple LC resonators, and we use them for reasons I won't go into in too much detail, for um, reading out the state of the qubit, and all of this is needed for, for each qubit. So the tricky part now, if we want to actually build a 2D array, is how to fit all of this on one chip. And you can see on, on this image here, we're already using a significant amount of 2D space just to do all the plumbing around these qubits. There's no space to expand into a two-dimensional array with this layout that we have right now. So we need to do something a bit more creative. And uh, there's an airplane flying over my head. Can you guys hear it or is screened out well? It's a bit. Okay. Because it, it, I live next to an airport, and if I need to stop talking every time the airplane flies over, I will. But if you can just hear me, I'll keep talking. No worries. Okay, good. So um, the thing that we need to do is figure out how to squish all of this control and readout and uh, you know this, this plumbing for the qubits into the small amount of space in between them and build a unit cell. And once you can build this unit cell, then it, you can tile it however many times you want the physical act of building more qubits is just as simple as, as going copy paste. The tricky part is figuring out how to lay out this unit cell in a clean way so that you are able to do this copy pasting. Um, we, we worked on that and actually one of the ways that we were able to, to lay out this unit cell was by expanding into a third dimension. So you can kind of see this, this chip there's actually two chips. There's one top chip with qubits on it and another chip with all of that plumbing underneath and we squish them together to make a, a hybrid chip. So in essence, we leave the qubits, this blue stuff on one chip and we put the yellow and red on, on the other chip. That allows us to build this, uh, this unit cell that we can tile. And for starters, we, we picked, you know, we're aiming for around 50. So nine times six is, is 54. We started with that cell, uh, that array, and we fabricated the chip we put it in some specially developed packaging. We bolted it to the bottom of a dilution refrigerator, cooled it down to 20 millikelvin, and then the real work started. And I, I say that very lightly. I mean, the, there was lots and lots of work to get to this point. And a lot of the work that I personally did on the, on the system is pictured on this slide. But this is really just the beginning because from here we need to get to a point where we can also use these 54 qubits we have to go through a process called calibration. Uh, one of my colleagues who is an 
an excellent musician came up with this analogy and I really like it. So you can think of calibration as being something like learning to play an instrument. When a musician wants us to hear a particular note, a very good musician, one of the things that makes them so good is that they are really, really well calibrated on their instrument. They know how to produce exactly the correct sound wave to get us to hear exactly the note that they want. And similarly, we, we need to do a similar exercise with our qubits. We want the qubit to perceive a specific rotation on the block sphere. So we want it to, to experience a very particular gait that corresponds to a very specific electrical wave that will impinge on the qubit, um, which is of course bolted at the base of the dilution refrigerator. We only have access to control electronics, our instruments that are outside at room temperature. So it's a very tricky process to, to learn which electrical wiggles do we need to send outside at room temperature in order to get the qubits to respond in the way we want. Of course, the only thing we can ever ask the qubit is yes or no. You know, we, we, we can only perform quantum measurements ultimately at some point. So the, this calibration exercise is quite a bit of work. Um, and in fact, we need also for the calibration to not be uh, an effort of graduate students poking in the lab or, or research scientists poking in the lab. This can't be a manual process. We need to not only have excellent performance, but it needs to be automated. When you have one or two or eight qubits, maybe you can sit there and turn knobs on your electronics all day and bring up some, through some heroic effort, a system where the qubits are performing properly. For 54 qubits, it's just not possible. And, and so, the other aspect of this is it's no longer enough to say we we brought in the real pro and he did his best work on on one day and we through through this great effort we got the the best possible calibration scheme no it really needs to be something that a computer can do and do good enough and so we started programming this in and automating this calibration scheme this this uh graph that I'm showing here, each of these dots is, you could think, uh, a science experiment. So it's an, an experiment on a qubit. You collect some measurements, you fit to some model, and it informs a parameter related to our calibration. And many of them rely on each other. This graph is just for bringing up one qubit with single qubit gates. So there are already about 50 nodes here. And we have 54 qubits, and we also need to uh, calibrate multi-qubit gates. So that's quite a bit of work. And I want to introduce a little bit then how we check, how we can check the gates once we have brought them up. So one way is using this cross-entropy benchmarking fidelity, we call it. And you can think of this as an accuracy score. It's a value between 0 and 1. Um, 1 means good, 0 means bad. And the, I don't want to go into too much detail because there's a lot of other material that I'm, I want to cover as well. But basically, we can select a gate. We can then run a circuit many, many times and check what the outcome is. In this case, if we start with just one qubit, we perform a gate and we measure it, we get zero or one. We compare with what it should be if the gate is what we think it is, and that allows us to get this accuracy score. And then we increase the number of gates and we see are the output statistics what we would expect for them to be. We can also do this, uh, this check with a set of two qubit gates and the calibration sequence for bringing up a single two qubit gate is even bigger. And of course, this is just a single two qubit gate. We have them across the chip. So for bringing up the entire chip, there are thousands of nodes. And um, one of my colleagues likes to joke and, and it's not really a joke, his, his PhD was that one node. He, he spent his whole PhD on the calibration work to get from that one little blue circle to the next little blue circle. So this is really, uh, there's, there's a lot of work going on here and, and it, we should not, we cannot underestimate the, the relevance of this calibration hurdle. Um, but in the end, we brought up this, this uh, array of qubits their, the gate performance was actually quite good. So this was all automatic, but we, we got to a single qubit error rate of about, well, the numbers are on the screen. I don't need to read them to you, but the, the really important part about this is that 
it's it was brought up by a computer. It was not tuned by hand. And this was for both single qubit gates and for two qubit gates, which are all operating simultaneously on, on the full array of qubits. So again, we could imagine a state in which we've simply isolated. Can you see my mouse? Lorenza, can you see my mouse? Okay. If I do. These, these, these pluses represent the single qubit gates and the rectangles represent the two qubit gates. And if we were maybe only looking at this two qubit gate and we had everybody else shut off, you would expect that we would see a higher performance than trying to run the whole chip at the same time. But of course, in real life, we need to run the whole chip at the same time. So we need to quote metrics that are not just single gates operating or in isolation, but really with the whole system performing at the same time. And that's the way that we quote these numbers. Um, so here's a picture of the whole system together. Yeah, Sorry. Lorenza? Sorry, can you go back to that uh, previous slide before you leave it? Um, you said that this was, this tune up was performed uh, in an automated way. Uh, and yeah. that's very important. I was wondering in this context, um, do you have a physical understanding of the limiting uh, mechanisms contributing uh, the error rates for single and two qubit gates? Yes, to a good degree, um, to, to within some error and the error and the error is, is fuzzy still, but yes, we, th we, th think we have a pretty good understanding of our gate error rate. A lot of it is limited by decoherence. So the, the T1 of these qubits is not the highest we've ever made. Yeah. There were a lot of other things that we had to get working in order to get this whole system working. And as part of that, T1 suffered a bit. We expect that that's one of the biggest contributors to the error rates. OK. I'll let you continue. I have more. Um, so anyway, there, there is a photo of the whole thing together. You can see basically lots of wires and that's, uh, that's a big kind of most obvious characteristic of the system is that there are lots and lots of wires. So with that, we have our quantum system. And finally, we would like to use it to show a small milestone computational task and to do this, okay, we, we put up that linear time or, or qubit number, this is a logarithmic qubit number plot at the beginning showing at a uh, million qubits, we can hopefully get the full error corrected quantum computer. At 10 qubits, we had you know publications up until last year, but at maybe around 50, we start to enter this interesting regime where we can go only with quantum hardware and no classical computer can mimic the experiences of the quantum computer in that space. So we would like to push into that space and explore it a little bit. Um, we would like to try to beat a classical computer at something. And this kind of brings us back to the old concept that an abacus and any modern classical computer at a fundamental level are effectively, they, they can efficiently simulate each other, which is to say they're, they're effectively in the same computation class or they live in the same uh, strength of, or quality of computation. But the quantum computer is different. It is, it is fundamentally a different type of machine. It cannot be efficiently simulated by an abacus or a classical computer. And we, we want to kind of push into that and, and take advantage of that. And so we define this task called quantum supremacy, uh, which is a well-defined computer science milestone. We say it's been achieved when a quantum computer can perform a, a task and it may be a con contrived task, but that would take too much resources on any classical computing machine. So uh, what sort of task would we like for that? Well, the ideal task would be something that can be solved with a quantum computer and would be very, very difficult to solve on a classical computer, but very easy to check using a classical computer. So the, the favorite idea would be something like factoring. We know that this is very hard to solve classically, but obviously it's very easy to check. 
or a function inversion would be another idea. Unfortunately, the quantum hardware that we built today is simply not yet adequately sophisticated to run these kinds of algorithms. It, it's not possible. So we need to revise our set of requirements for this task a little bit. And of course, the first two are non-negotiable, but the last one, we can, we can get a little wiggle room there. So what kind of task can we use for trying to demonstrate quantum supremacy? Um, well, we can do something like this, which is to, we, we'll ask the question, if I carefully choose a quantum circuit, I carefully choose the identities of these gates, these, these white boxes and blue boxes, um, what is the output distribution I should expect? Or more, more specifically, how can I sample the output distribution I can expect? So if I were to run this circuit, if I were to run this circuit, which bit strings are the most likely ones to be measured? And at first, that seems a little bit uh, obvious in some ways, because that's exactly what a quantum computer does. It runs a quantum circuit and uh, it produces bit strings as an outcome. But this is actually a well-studied problem also from a computer science perspective, that when we choose the gates, the identity of those gates randomly, that is we fill in these boxes, these gray boxes, choosing those gates from a random distribution that actually is a well-studied problem and, it, and doing so guarantees that we have a high computational complexity. That means we know already that this will be classically very difficult because it has been studied as a classical computer science problem. Um, so if we were to try to use this as our task for demonstrating quantum supremacy, what would that look like? Well, the first step, of course, is to pick a quantum circuit whose output distribution we want to sample. And then we can go at it once with the quantum computer and once with the classical computer. We would pick the best strategy in each case. Of course, the best quantum strategy is simply to run the circuit on the quantum hardware. And the best classical strategy would be to actually simulate quantum mechanics. We don't know a better way to, to learn the output distribution sampling of uh, an unknown random quantum circuit other than to simulate quantum mechanics using a big classical computer. So after doing both of these, we can determine the classical cost that it would take in order to, uh, to represent the work that the quantum machine did. And if that is too high, then we would say we have achieved quantum supremacy. Now, of, of course, uh, the fact that we say too high and, and too much, that indicates, of course, that the goalposts are moving. I mean, this is, this is not a, a uh, arbitrarily given by nature line. This is really a comparison between the current state of two technologies. But we also observe that the computational power grows much faster in a quantum system by adding a little bit more quantum juice from, uh, than, from, than it does from the classical side, from adding a few more bits of memory or, or such. And I'll get into that a bit more in a little bit. So um, actually running this experiment has two phases. First is the, the verification phase where we check and make sure the quantum computer is running correctly. And then the second part is the, the supremacy actual demonstration in which we are no longer able to fully check that the computer is the quantum computer is running properly because it's doing something that no classical computer can follow. But I'll start by sort of explaining what happens in this verification regime. So first what we do is we we try to run some some simple circuits on our quantum hardware and we model the errors and we compare the the data that we see with the errors that we expect. So for example, we have measured, as shown on the previous slide, we have a bunch of uh, single qubit fidelities and two qubit gate fidelities and, and measurement fidelities, which are known. And basically we take this very simple model that the total fidelity of running a big circuit will depend on the specific gate errors for all of the qubits involved. And on this plot, we have the total fidelity on the y-axis and the number of qubits used on the x-axis for a fixed number of cycles, that is uh, 14 time slices of gates. 
And you would expect the more gates you do, the, the lower the fidelity will be in total. And we can draw this plot just based on uh, taking a particular patch. We know the, the single and two qubit gate errors for that particular patch. We can use them to determine for a certain number of cycles how much error we should see and so on and so forth. We can grow that patch and uh, draw this model for the entire system. And this is, this is just uh, a model. There's the, the next thing that we would need to do is collect data to compare with that model. So now we actually run circuits. We, we will choose a random circuit and run it many, many times, measure a bit string for each time we run that same random circuit, put all of that information into our classical computer, which can give us this accuracy score. And then we can see uh, our model prediction in black, our full circuit in red and our simplified circuit in green. And the simplification of the circuit is really just changing a little bit the way these two qubit gates are arranged in order to make it a little bit easier on the classical computer to give us this information. So um, it, it doesn't really make the, the work any easier for the quantum computer, but it does make the, the job of the classical computer a little bit easier. And that allows us to get more data out into this regime where it would otherwise take way too long to verify the performance of the quantum computer. So the first thing that we see uh, quite remarkably, or, or maybe expectedly, I don't know, it depends how much faith you have in, in us experimentalists, but uh, you see that the data actually overlaps exceedingly well with the model. And so the take home from this is within this classically verifiable regime, our quantum computer is actually behaving exactly as we expect. The quantum processor is working. There are not additional error mechanisms that come from using many, many qubits together that we didn't already capture in the gate error measurements that we did before. Because remember, this model only is based on local single and two qubit gate uh, error measurements. And uh, as I hinted at before, we are, we're a little weak on data on those red circles out here. That's because already this, this one red dot, which is 53 qubits and 14 cycles, would took about the equivalent of five hours to verify with one million cores. So this is the point where the Google Data Center people start to call us and wonder why we're using so much of their resources and is it really worth that much of Google's money for us to be using all of this uh, compute power. And uh, so then we push into the regime where it's no longer possible for any quantum computer, excuse me, for any classical computer to mimic the performance of the quantum computer. And I, you can see here that there are not any more red dots. That's because of course you cannot actually perform that full simulation anymore, but we have these, these simplified circuits still. And that is because, as I said before, it's possible to sort of reshuffle the, the two qubit gates a little bit to make the problem more easily uh, factorable basically for the, the classical computer so that we can check almost the same thing as what the quantum computer is doing. And, and we can check these simplified circuits, but then we also run the more difficult full circuits, which cannot be verified anymore. And uh, we have in fact archived those circuits and, and that data so that in the future when classical computer power is greater, anyone can come along and try to run, uh, try to verify that data and see um, now, I mentioned that we we used Google data centers to try to, uh, the, the Google data center computing power as part of our verification program, but we also collaborated with a handful of very powerful supercomputing centers and, and people with a lot of expertise in actually simulating quantum systems. This is a, a big focus of the Jülich Forschungszentrum in Germany. And we also collaborated with NASA and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which has Summit, the uh, today largest, most powerful supercomputer in the world. Um, there are actually two different strategies that we use for simulating these quantum, uh, quantum states. 
we call them the Schrodinger simulation and the Schrodinger Feynman simulation style. And basically the, the Schrodinger approach stores all the amplitudes and simulates the full, full circuit. So it, it steps through a layer by layer of gates and requires in the end would require dozens of petabytes of memory running for a few days, but, but you would need dozens of petabytes to store all of the amplitudes in our full supremacy circuit. So the full um, circuit that I was showing here, which goes up to 20 cycles deep on 53 qubits. And there is no computer with dozens of petabytes of memory. So that would, that, that's why we run into the classical limit using the Schrodinger simulation. There's another approach that we could take instead if we wanted to be, uh, we can basically trade memory for time. And we can, if you run out of memory, but you still want to simulate a big circuit, you can cut it into smaller pieces and then try to stitch them back together. In this case, we basically work one amplitude at a time and we could compromise on the amount of memory. Maybe you have only terabytes of memory, but um, this, the circuits that we run in the end would require millennia using terabytes of memory. So however you slice it, literally, um, you, you run into a ridiculous resource requirement for a classical computer to emulate what we did with the quantum system. So the take home message there, I, I basically indicated this before, but um, is that this processor we built, we've called it the Sycamore processor, this is our quantum processor, can run 53 qubit circuits with a fidelity that is uh, known, well known to be greater than zero. And that, of course, sounds a little bit funny at first, too. We would like to say that our computer does the right thing most of the time. And what I said instead is it does the right thing at all. Um, yes, it is still, uh, there, there, are, there are many, many errors. And this particular algorithm is extremely sensitive to errors. But what is important is that enough of the time for it to be visible, the computer actually does run the entire algorithm correctly with no error. And, and that is pretty remarkable for a 53 qubit system of depth 20. So the, the, the even more remarkable thing about that is that we have a pretty good handle on where the errors are coming from. And the, the fidelities, even for this large scale quantum system are actually well predicted by a simple model that just depends on individual error. Uh, for single gates and two qubit gates, single qubit and two qubit gates. Um, and uh, of course, it, it's also interesting in some regard that achieving that same fidelity on classical machines would require very, very much, uh, very, very large amounts of, of resources, whether it's time or memory. So uh, with that, we, we've basically done our small milestone computational task and, and pushed into a regime where no no classical computer can go. And uh, kind of the, the big picture, we're taking a step back, is we're really exercising this idea that quantum computer works fundamentally differently from a classical computer. And, and for the first time, we're kind of bringing that idea into the lab in a, in a very concrete way. But it, it also gives us a tool for playing with computer science, playing with quantum computer science in a way that was not available before. In the past, uh, when people write quantum algorithms, it's entirely uh, an exercise in writing a good proof because there's no way to do an, a physical heuristic exploration if you don't have the hardware to support it. But now we are starting to build hardware that can allow us to, de to develop quantum algorithms by, by playing, by heuristics, by, by some exploration, rather than only by writing a proof. And I don't mean to, to dismiss the, the importance of, of proof-based algorithm development at all, but I, but I have to observe that a lot of the developments in machine learning in computer science in the last several years have come from a more heuristic style uh, development rather than algorithms that we fully understand before we use them. And so being able to embark and, and explore computers, uh, being able to explore quantum computer science in the same way is, is another good tool to put into our toolbox of uh, quantum computer science. 
And then from a physics perspective, of course, um, this is this is also very interesting for a number of reasons. You know, on the one hand, we we find that quantum mechanics still works for these highly complex systems, and uh, I've. I feel like I've been living in this kind of a statement since my PhD, you know, loophole free bell experiment. There are people who say, well, why do you bother? Of course, quantum mechanics still works. And then there are people who think it's highly critical and absolutely necessary for, for our, our daily philosophy to hold it, that, that this experiment be done. And in some ways, the, the supremacy experiment is not dissimilar. There's, there were people who said that this experiment would be impossible because a Hilbert space of two to the 53 is simply too big and quantum mechanics uh, won't quite hold there anymore. And, and maybe quantum computing is completely impossible because the states just get too big and then quantum, then the whole quantum theory breaks down. And of course, if that were the case, it would also be fascinating. Then we would have more, more physics to explore. But in fact, it appears that quantum computing is possible uh, and quantum mechanics still does work for spaces of this size. So with that uh, sort of conclusion and slight look toward the future, I want to wrap up and thank the, the big group that made this possible uh, and then also take whatever questions may still be outstanding. Thank you, Marisa. And uh, I would like to propose a virtual, uh, you know, applause. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, I also am very glad that you have left the room for questions. Let me take the chance to say that we will not have a follow up meeting due like for virtual coffee because of conflicting time requirements. So let me see. I see uh, one hand is up. Rahul, uh, there you go. Uh, can I speak now? Yes. Okay, great. I can hear you. Okay, great. I have three questions uh, that are related and in increasing order of difficulty. So maybe I'll start with the simplest one and then move on. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Yeah, and there are other questions after, so be wary of the time constraint. Yeah, okay. So the, let me do the first one, but they're related as you'll see. If instead of two uh, components in the squid, I had many, I could get instead of a cosine potential, a more diffraction grading like potential that mm -hmm. might change your error and fidelity properties and the control of the state. Do you think that would affect your fidelity versus number of qubits curve that you showed? So I, I think that when you start to bring in more junctions, that's then yes. a different, that's a different system. Yeah. And there, it might be possible to, I think that would be an interesting system to explore. And uh, at the same time, the junctions are the trickiest part of our system to fabricate and get right. They are the most fragile part. When something breaks, it's almost always a junction. And uh, in addition, if you, th there's, there's also a constant trade-off around building a whole system of allowing space for all the control you want so that you can really tune that system into being the best system it can be. Um, but in, al in order to bring that control line in, you need another wire that goes all the way from room temperature down to the millikelvin temperature and you need uh, electronics for driving it and so on. So there's there's kind of a balance that we're always looking for between uh, a system which is nice and well behaved and easy to control, but not too much control required in order to bring it to a, a place where we can use it. And this is where we are today. Um, but it's not to say that this is the end all be all of qubits. I, I was actually just yesterday and this morning uh, attending a little conference, another virtual conference on novel qubit architectures. And there are many ideas people have of alternatives to this, the basic transmon or frequency tunable transmon that we are using here. The second question, which was sort of related to the first, as you'll see as we proceed, is if you look at probabilistic analog systems that work with thermal noise uh, that avoid random number generation and can naturally emulate Poisson processes. It's very, very difficult to do this on a digital computer uh, using 
even the Gillespie stochastic simulation algorithm. So one of the questions for you is both in Shore as well as in random simulation algorithms that involve probability and random number generation, there are two effects that get confused. One is the coherent wave interference that makes quantum computing very powerful and the fact that it can do these amazing random number unbiased searches very nicely leveraging randomness. Uh, and sure leverages both. So what I'm wondering is how much of your benefit is coming from the fact that since only one qubit gate talks to four neighbors, and I'm not sure that all two raised to 53 cross coherences in the Hilbert space have been verified, that you're actually leveraging mostly the probabilistic randomness and power of the quantum computer rather than the two raised to 53 simultaneously cross coherent large Hilbert space benefit. I'm not sure that I completely understood your question, but I think you are asking if I, I'm gonna have trouble articulating what I think you're asking, but I know how I want to answer it. Um, <laughs> the, I think you are concerned that our random circuit is, that, that in essence, we are testing our quantum processor's ability to be a great producer of random numbers. And in fact, we are, we are testing its ability to be a, a good producer of the right random numbers. Mm -hmm. So I want to highlight something about this task, which is a very common misconception, and, and I'm, I'm glad to get the opportunity to address it. Um, the computational task is to sample the output distribution from a carefully chosen quantum circuit. So it is not the case that I allow nature to pick the identities of the gates. I pick the identities of these gates. I choose that this one is going to be a square root of X and this one is going to be a square root of, of Y and this one is going to be a square root of Z or, or however I will arrange it. And then I check, is the actual outcome that I get when I, when I run this circuit, does it correspond to what I would expect based on those particular choices of, uh, of circuit? So there, I'm not actually deriving randomness out of my processor. That's not what's going on here. I am, I am injecting randomness in the choice of what algorithm is to be run. And then I'm comparing the performance of the computer with, of, of the quantum processor with what it should be uh, in, if it were performing without error to run that same algorithm. Does that clarify a bit? I think this is a deeper discussion, but you have answered part of the question, so I won't ask the third one. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I will pass, I believe that the next one in line uh, can have your own. Can have? Uh, it looks like can is still muted and Raul is still. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Marisa. Th thank you for the great talk. Okay. Looking at the dimensions of the device that you showed, it was uh, each qubit was close to uh, 200 to 300 micrometers. Is that right? Uh, the qubits are on the order of a few hundred microns. Yes. Yeah. So if you put like thousand of them on the same chip, and if you're projecting to 10,000, I'm just wondering how would that happen? That would make the device to be too big to fit on a um, in that device. You need big. a bigger boat. Yeah. Exactly. You need a bigger boat. Uh, you, you need a bigger cryostat. So yes, to, that, that's a very astute observation. In order to build a system of a million qubits, it will be much bigger than the kinds of systems we are looking at today. And uh, in particular, I, I, you know, when, when you actually look at the way the system looks today, what you see is a big spaghetti of wires. And so in, in particular, if you are going to put millions of qubits somewhere, you're going to have millions and millions of wires, and those all have to go someplace as well. So yes, uh, the short answer is the next 
Uh, are you there, planning on different indeed, architecture? That is indeed a problem. Uh, sorry, did I cut you off? Were you finished answering or asking your question? So uh, uh, another uh, follow-up to that is, are you planning on different architecture? Are you planning on uh, different qubit sizes, thinking of reducing the qubit size? It would be very nice to reduce the qubit size. And I, I'm sure that is something that we will, we and, and the community would, would be looking into. On the other hand, you don't want to decrease the qubit size too much because at some point you still need to get the wires down there and you can only make wires so small. And if your qubit is much, much smaller than a wire, then you haven't really won because you still need to get the signal to the qubit somehow. So um, I think the direction we'll be pushing is, yeah, it would be nice to make the qubits a bit smaller, but there will be a significant systems engineering challenge in how to make the rest of the system bigger. Just one quick question. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not cutting everyone out. Uh, so what is the life cycle? Uh, when can you go from 53 qubits to let's say 60 or the next iteration? So let's say if we're thinking of 15 uh, year uh, timeline, can we expect the number of qubits to uh, double every year, sort of like a Moore's law? Or do you think it's going to take uh, much more effort doubling the number of qubits? That's a good question also. So I, it depends. As, as I see it, different parts of the system, uh, now let me take one more step back. I, I showed in my original plot that until about six months ago, the limits of publications were about 10 qubits. And the, the technology developments that we had to make in order to go from order of 10 qubits to 53, involved developments in many places in the stack. We had to change our, our chip architecture from the single planar chip to this hybrid sandwich chip. We needed to develop an entirely new package. We needed to develop entirely new electronics. The electronics that we were using before were so big that we would not have been able to fit enough racks around the cryostat to run all 54 cub or 53 qubits in the old style. So we had to condense and, and re rearrange the way we ran the electronics. And now that we're just, we have these two crates that you can see and all of the electronics needed to run these qubits runs out of that, those crates. Um, so we can then brute force that technology a bit further. And each of those pieces of technology will again run into a wall at some point. So how quickly we can get from the current generation to the next generation or, or what the qubit number Delta is really depends on which technologies happen to be hitting the wall at that particular point. Um, with, with what we have now, you know, we're, we're starting to think getting to 100 is probably something we can do without having to change too much, uh, you know, with, with, with just sort of brute force scaling the technologies that we developed to get from 10 to 50. But to get to several hundred or a thousand, we will certainly need to rethink a few of the aspects of that technology. And then to get from a thousand to 10,000 will be a more significant shift. Thank you so much. Okay, there are two more questions that I can see. So because of time constraint, I would ask, uh, uh, so James and Jay, uh, you're next, uh, maybe. Uh, Lorenza, I can I can take another five five okay, or so okay. minutes. So no, I have a meeting that starts at one, but I can be late. So. Uh, okay, so James. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I want to say thank you for this excellent talk. This is uh, really great. It's also nice to see you again. Um, I nice did... to see you as a as a box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I mean, I was really excited to hear about this uh, this automated calibration. I, I actually the first time I've heard of this, um, and it seems a really interesting idea to kind of encapsulate all these experiments and all these efforts that people have done over many years. Um, so I'm wondering, with that piece of technology, independent of the actual experiment you've done here, how far? Hang on, just a sec. I can't hear because of the airplane. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just saying this this idea of having automated calibration where you're really encapsulating a lot of calibration experiments seems like it would be possible to do in many other experiments, many other systems in many other places mm -hmm. throughout, I don't know. Um, Absolutely. Think, yeah. So I was wondering, did you guys also have plans to kind of push that into a larger, I don't know, anything? Uh, well, it, so it's certainly used across our lab and every every how would I say this? 
we we have the whole team that's working on calibration is working out of a shared code base. We, we have one common code repository for the whole lab. And as people develop new improvements to the calibration, those get developed and tested and then pushed into this master code base that the whole lab uses. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it also means that somebody's, that, that person A working on one piece of the calibration can inadvertently break uh, the work of person C working on another piece of the calibration or possibly working on something completely else who is borrowing, uh, who's using code that is touched by the thing person A did. So it's a, uh, it's not without a level of sort of social understanding for how to share code and, and how to work together and um, how, how to work in a collaborative code base. When you say, so, so we, we already use this for, for basically as, as far as we can, whatever experiments we can do in an automated fashion, we do. Um, but maybe I haven't quite understood your question of, of how do you mean like making that open source or, or no, just broadly the, taking the idea of calibrating experiments and, and all these things that you mentioned end up being parts of PhDs and having them all automated instead of whatever fashion. So it seems like this might be a very general idea. Uh, the, the one other question I wanted to ask and not to take uh, switch is just, can you calibrate to an algorithm? And that's, that's it. Sorry, could you repeat? I didn't quite hear you. Calibrate towards an algorithm instead of just doing random circuits to calibrate towards um, particular. Oh, so, so the calibration that we do is for certain gates. So um, in this case, we don't, we don't run the calibration to optimize for a, a specific random circuit. We calibrate to optimize a certain gate and it is a constant, it is a constantly evolving, uh, we have a constantly evolving understanding of how to best test our gate performance. Do we test a bunch of random gates, but an algorithm is structured, so uh, we may not have a good metric of how good those gates actually are if we are only testing them on random circuits. If we test them on a structured algorithm, maybe we are uh, overly sensitive to a thing that's specific to that one algorithm and that won't really represent how well this gate would perform in a different algorithm. So um, you kind of touched on the crux of what's so difficult about bringing up a large scale quantum processor. It's really unclear. It, it's difficult to, to find a metric or to, to identify a metric that says how good it performs but is not specific to one particular problem. And, and that, is a, that is an area of active research. And, um, you can, looking through the literature, you find everybody, the, the favorite benchmarking flavor of the week. There's randomized benchmarking and purity benchmarking and cross entropy benchmarking and speckle purity and, and this, that, and the other thing. And these are all different approaches uh, with different pluses and minuses for how to characterize the quality of the calibration of a system. But I would say that the jury is still really out on what the best one will be. And, it, and it's probably going to evolve as our understanding of the needs of the quantum algorithms evolves and as those quantum algorithms are developed. So this is really gonna be a, a handshake and a back and forth, probably between the hardware developers and the algorithm developers as to what metric is, is really the best metric or the most useful metric uh, to, to tell an algorithm developer, hey, this quantum computer is or isn't good enough for you to use for your algorithm. Um, I, Did that touch on what you're asking? Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I, just a comment. Uh, I also think that this is a big area uh, open to research in, in theory. My understanding is also that uh, there is no single metric that is going to capture all the features that will make a good or bad or average performance. So yes, uh, but I know that we are tight on time. So I will just let uh, Jay, uh, you are on. Last questions, go for it. Jay? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lorenza. Oh, Marisa, thank you for this wonderful talk. It's, it's nice. It's so good to hear you. <laughs> yeah. 
you. <laughs> it's nice to see you, and I wish you were here. But you know, the day will come. I wish I were here. I wish I were here too. <laughs> so I like that you ended up with a foundational question, and it reminds me of Anton Zeilinger and all of his beautiful experiments, like with buckyballs and stuff. Um, so I agree that we don't know that quantum mechanics will work forever. And at some point, um, maybe you guys, somebody is going to test these, you know, to, to, to make that test and maybe um, provide a test of these objective collapse theories that we have. Mm -hmm. So I see no reason why this, you know, why, why these systems are, are not perhaps achieving a complexity that will, that will hit that uh, boundary if it exists. And we really don't. Thank know. you. I, I agree that there's, there is fundamental, there, there are dis definite fundamental questions in uh, this kind of work. Actually, a friend of mine from Vienna pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago, as we were talking about e experiments and work, he said, Marissa, you've always worked on systems problems. And I said, that's funny. That sounds like a very engineering mindset. And, and he said, well, foundational questions are based on building a really uh, building a system, not just uh, building a small element, but really building a whole system that can test a foundational question. And I hadn't put it, I hadn't seen it that way before, but indeed um, to properly address some of these foundational questions, you do need a system with adequate complexity control. And indeed that's what we're building. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, um, thermodynamics came from there. Um, so well, and now we're in a in a regime where quantum mechanics and thermodynamics are are both going that way, and it's very it's just uh, thrilling. Okay. Ah, uh, okay, Lorenza. Thank you. On that note, uh, I would really like to ask that you join me in thanking Marisa. And uh, thanks for a great talk. Thanks for virtually joining. And hopefully next time it will be in person. Uh, I won't see you next month in Santa Barbara because nothing will happen, but uh, keep up with all the outstanding work. Thank you, Marisa. Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and everyone for uh, appearing virtually and, and your patience with the virtual format. I, I hope to see you all sometime in the not too distant future in person. <laughs>